Hello and welcome to this edition of Political Capital, the show where Delhi meets the Lal Street. I'm Vivek Law. The last few years have seen a number of historic rulings by the country's judiciary. Courts picked up the onus of laying down the rule of law where the executive failed to do its job. Along the way, the Supreme Court was attacked by the previous government for encroaching on its territory, while others welcomed judicial activism as a necessity owing to the failure of the executive. But even as a debate on judicial accountability rages, an exhaustive study of the judiciary by Law Information Center, Universal Law Publishing, reveals a lot about the functioning of the judiciary. Priyal and Ashpreet get us each aspect of this report card. Let me also welcome shortly Mohan Parasaran, one of India's sharpest legal minds and the former Solicitor General of India. But let me start with you, Priyal. Uh, let's first look at the performance of uh, the judiciary, especially certain judges and certain benches in relationship to the percentage of matters that came before them and the orders or judgments that were delivered on them. Well, essentially, you know, the key uh, criteria here that has been looked into is the number of benches that each of the judges were part of and uh, comparing it with the number of judgments and orders that they have given. Judgments essentially uh, are the rulings that come in and the decision that has been taken and orders come also includes the interim orders on particular cases. So based on the judges and uh, the, uh, the judgments and the orders, uh, let's look at the percentage uh, that has come about as far as uh, the Supreme Court judges were concerned. Uh, Justice Arijit Pasayat was the one who has come first in the category uh, in terms of about uh, you know, having 82.6% uh, in terms of the number of benches he was part of and about uh, the number of judgments and orders that he has delivered, which is going up to the level of 2,198 versus 2,661 benches that he was part, part of. Uh, close to him comes uh, the former TDSAT chairman and also Justice S.B. Uh, Justice S. Sinha of the Supreme Court with about 74.8% as he was part of about over 2,000 benches and delivered about 1,500 orders uh, as far as his record is concerned in the Supreme Court during his entire tenure. Following him is uh, former CGI Altamas Kabir at about 66.6% uh, with about 634 benches only that he served during his tenure in the Supreme Court, not just as the Chief Justice, but the entire tenure and about 422 judgments and orders is what he has delivered. So essentially a ratio coming in in terms of the number of benches they've been part of and the judgments that they have delivered. Let's see the in, in the list in the bottom uh, comes in Justice Eric Joseph, uh, who has give, who has the percentage of 1.8%, given only seven judgments and orders of the 398 benches uh, that he has been uh, serving and being part of. Uh, following him then is Justice R.C. Patnayak uh, with about just three judgments and orders in about 44 uh, benches that he has been part of. Limited number of benches in comparison to Sarek Joseph, who we just talked about. Close then comes at 10.4% is Justice Gyan Shudham Mushra, uh, someone who's been in the news uh, for, for a lot of reasons lately until she retired, uh, with number of benches about 2011 and only 22 judgments or orders delivered uh, under her name at 10.4%. Let's look at the Chief Justices and their percentage uh, in terms of what has really come about. Remember, this is not about just their tenor as the Chief Justice, but their tenor as the entire, as, as serving as justices in the Supreme Court. First is Altamas Kabir at 66.6%, Justice Y.K. Sabarwal at 63.2%. Uh, following thereafter is Justice K.G. Balakrishnan at 58.1%, Justice Y.V. Chandrachur at 48.3%, and Justice Kapadia, known for his Vodafone judgment, at 46.3%. All in all, of 212 judges that served in the Supreme Court, only, only about uh, 20, uh, 29 judges have a record of above 50 percentage figure of the number of benches that they were part of and the judgments and orders that they have delivered. 
All right, quite stunning numbers, those. Ashpreet, in its 64-year history, the Supreme Court has only grown in stature. How many judgments has the Apex Court passed over these decades? And do the numbers match up to the common belief that the court has been at its most active only in the last decade? Well, yes, if we go by what the sources are saying is that approximately 35,000 cases alone have been filed uh, in 2014, quite a huge number as far as pendency in Supreme Court is concerned. But if you look at the trend which has been followed as far as passing of judgments and orders is concerned, 2008 saw the maximum number of judgments or orders with a total of 2,122, while 2012-2013 saw a drop of about 240, uh, 848 to 880 orders of judgments that have been passed. But if you see since uh, 1950 to 2013, the total judgments and orders passed are 43,111. While it is quite a debate as far as pendency is concerned, what legal experts are saying is, is that adjournments is quite an issue and the Supreme Court also takes a lot of time uh, to list matters. Also, there are uh, problems as far as lengthy arguments by lawyers are concerned, which is easily uh, acceptable by the Supreme Supreme Court, which uh, seems to be an opposition from most of the legal experts. So it's quite a trend which has come from the Supreme Court as far uh, as uh, uh, decreasing the number of orders or judgments over the years is concerned. Priya, let's uh, talk a little about the pendency. Uh, how, how has that moved over the years? Has it only increased? And is it a lot to do with the vacancies? Because we have been uh, reporting on the large number of vacancies across High Courts and Supreme Court as well. Absolutely, the dependency is stemming really from the vacancies across the courts. We've been reporting uh, quite a lot about number of vacancies that have taken place uh, in uh, a number of vacancies in the High Courts and the figures that have been revealed by the Law Information Center. Of course, uh, stares at a very uh, scary picture in the coming days with about almost 80 to uh, odd vacancies coming in now. But let me give you the picture: 260 vacancies are there in 24 high courts for judges uh, of the total 906 which is the strength across all 24 uh, high courts uh, in the country there are only 642 judges that are sitting so giving a back uh, giving a gap of about 264 as I pointed out earlier Allahabad High Court alone has a vacancy of about 78 judges uh, there. And if you look at it, in the coming years, in 2014 and 2015, 80 judges each year, 80 judges are expected to retire in 2014 across high courts. 80 judges are expected to retire uh, in 2015 across the high courts. And that's an alarming figure on this very question that when we already have 264 vacancies, would these retirements then, of course, uh, lead to a huge gap? And that gap of vacancies only, uh, you know, becoming larger by the day remains a concern as far as judiciary is concerned. Ashpreet, let me come back to you. Let's take a quick look at the track record on appointments. Which Chief Justice of India saw the most appointments to the Supreme Court bench in their tenure? Take us through those data points. Well, if we just go by the facts that have been obtained, the number of judges uh, that have been appointed during the Chief Justice of India's tenure include uh, 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 Chief Justice K.G. Balakrishnan's time, around 20 were recruited. Uh, as far as uh, Chief Justice Chandrachur is concerned, around 14 were recruited. But over the years, the rec rec recruitment has also come down with uh, when Chief Justice Kapadia was there, there were eight recruitments. But when uh, ju uh, Chief Justice Altamas Kabir was there, there were seven. While uh, Chief Chief Justice Sata Sivan was there, there were one. There were also no appointments during the tenure of former Chief Justices K. N. Singh, L. M. Sharma, G. P. Uh, Patnayak, and Senior Babu. So it means that uh, it has come down uh, drastically uh, as far as judges' appointment during uh, Chief Justice of India's tenure is concerned. All right, let's take a quick break here on Political Capital. We assess the Indian judiciary's track record with former Solicitor General Mohan Parasar. And that's coming up after the break. Welcome back. You're watching Political Capital on Bloomberg TV India. India's judiciary has been arguably over the last decade the most visible form 
of this vibrant democracy of ours. But how has the judicial system dealt with mounting litigation? Is any course correction and reform needed to keep the judiciary best placed to tackle the challenges of the coming years? Joining me to talk about that and a lot more, one of the country's sharpest legal minds, former Solicitor General Mohan Parasaran. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Parasaran, for joining us. We've been, uh, over the last uh, 15 minutes, been putting out some data points, interesting data points that have been collated uh, in this book that has been prepared. Some of the findings I want to discuss with you. One of the findings that uh, really struck me was that if you look at the uh, almost about 200 plus odd judges of the Supreme Court who also ended up being the Chief Justice, only 20 odd of them had a 50% and plus track record of passing judgments and orders on the cases that came before them. Uh, do, do you feel that that somehow doesn't kind of reflect very well on uh, the ability to be able to dispose of cases and pass judgments? See, uh, in many cases, the judgments are actually passed uh, or delivered by only one of the judges sitting on the bench. The Supreme Court normally comprises of two judges or three judges or the constitution bench by five judges or seven judges. In many cases you will see even a combination of two or three, only one judge used to write the judgment. And uh, that is why the percentile in respect of some judges have been quite less when compared to others. But as far as uh, my view is concerned, I think it is a combination of human resources, technology and innovation which have to be combined for improving the system. Why, why, why do not you explain that a bit more? Are you really saying that uh, the, the speed or the efficacy or the ability to pass judgments is very much there? It is more an issue of uh, lack of adequate number of uh, judges. In fact, that is the next point that I wanted to talk to you about because this data shows the enormous yeah, amount of uh, uh, lack of resources at many of the high courts and even in the Supreme Court. See, let me be quite candid, no? In the Supreme Court, uh, the uh, filing has uh, gone up to about 34,000 cases uh, last year. And uh, this is actually, I think, uh, thrice over when you compare uh, to the 1970s or so. And the high courts are also actually virtually cracking down with so many cases being filed year after year. And uh, the Supreme Court was never intended to hear actually small petty rent control matters, bail applications, check bouncing cases, etc. But they have been hearing it to satisfy the common man. And now actually it is ultimate court for the common people as well. But uh, what I would like to actually suggest is, I think we must actually restrict arguments. Now they amended the Supreme Court rules previously, more than one counsel used to represent a single client and used to consume enormous time. Now I think uh, the court should actually follow the American system by reducing actually the arguing time for each case and fix actually time slots for final hearing matters and uh, divide subject wise cases, constitutional matters, important questions of law, constitution bench they can actually at best give not more than 3 hours per each side and request the parties to give advanced submissions in writing. And the judges should also be ably be assisted by top class court clerks or law clerks who should also be paid attractive remuneration, you know. And they should actually maintain strict confidence. Mm. And with the advancement of technology, I think they should be, be ably be assisted by these court clerks so that when they hear the case, the judges are actually fully actually well versed with all the nuances and intricacies of the case and they will be only putting pointed questions to the counsel straight away. And so the hearing is concluded short oh. in, shortly in a day's time or so. That is what happens in the US, in Australia and England. Oh. 
And likewise, and do you believe, uh, Mr. Parasaran, that what matters. you just suggested? Uh, what, 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 one moment. Yeah. Uh, what you just suggested, uh, do you believe that this is something that the judiciary, the Supreme Court in this case, or the high courts can very well do themselves? They don't need to rely on the executive in any manner to do what you just suggested. See, this uh, would require actually definitely a lot of uh, finance as well. For that purpose, uh, naturally the executive's help is required and I think uh, as far as the executive is concerned, uh, no executive I think uh, would actually shirk in the responsibility when actually something good is going to be done and uh, if the court actually takes a lead in this uh, issue by either a strong chief justice or a strong court, I think the executive I think uh, will come forward in uh, actually giving whatever financial aid that is uh, required and we should also have competent uh, men to uh, actually man the courts, you know, competent judges, that is actually the need of the hour. Hmm. I, I was talking about the other two important points you made Mr. Parasaran, one was uh, on being able to actually set a timetable and say look, uh, you know the time bound uh, hearing schedule that you talked about, you gave the American example, uh, you also talked about uh, the issue of taking up way too many cases, uh, you know, which may not necessarily be required for the highest court of the country. On these two issues, do you believe that the mandate okay. is very clearly with the judiciary and it can do it if it so wishes to? Absolutely, the court can do it. Okay. I think. Uh, what about the appointment the, of judges uh, the, issue? Appointment of judges. Yes, go ahead. Please I think finish. I still feel, I still feel, I think uh, the primacy should actually be with the judges because there is scope actually for uh, uh, this uh, appointment system being abused by the executive. And even though the original constitution actually did vest this power with the executive government, the court actually interpreted the constitution and uh, revested that power within themselves and uh, if that system actually can work in the interest of the independence of judiciary, why not? That is my view. Mr. Parasaran, who do you think and, uh, or why do you think we have yes. such a large amount of vacancies in the higher judiciary? Who would you blame for that? See, I would actually blame uh, some some cases. Actually, good lawyers actually don't accept judgeship. And uh, secondly, for instance, in some states, you don't have lawyers of that caliber to be elevated. That's why you find so many vacancies in some courts, which is also mentioned just now. And thirdly, I would actually like to mention that. Uh, Unfortunately, this sort of a reservation system has uh, been introduced in the appointment of judges. I think uh, this is rather unfortunate. You, you should actually give representation to all classes, but I feel in so far as appointment of judges is concerned, one has to strictly only go by merit. You cannot go by, you have to give representation to this section, that section and for example, if you take some high courts including the Madras High Court or Andhra Pradesh High Court, you would find actually specified number of vacancies for specified classes. I think that uh, to some extent uh, affects the performance and the quality in the dispensation of justice. All right, Mr. Parasan, we leave it there. Thank you very much for joining us and sharing your perspective on this very crucial issue. That's all the time we have on this edition of Political Capital. Thanks for watching.